Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This podcast series is proudly brought to you by Russell Investments. With more than 80 years of experience, Russell Investments is a global investment solution partner dedicated to helping investors reach their long-term goals. Russell Investments specialize in multi-asset solutions that combine asset allocation, capital markets insights, factor exposure, manager research, and portfolio implementation. Welcome back to the XY Advisor Podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and today we are kicking off our five-part series around all the different topics around ESG investing, essentially looking at environmental, social, and governance-focused investing. Uh, This is a podcast series brought to you by Russell Investments, and we have got five amazing speakers to talk through five different topics Uh, in this episode. We're looking at some of the marketing messages. Uh, In the next episode, we'll be thinking about, is there actually a need for ESG, and and what is it? Uh, We're going to dive deep in the third episode around 50 Shades of Green. Uh, Then we're going to look into the ES or G, and how do you prioritize those, Uh, And finally, in the last episode, we're going to be looking at supply and demand. Now, I'm very, very fortunate today to be joined by Philip Moffat. Now, Philip is a, uh, does many, wears many hats, I guess you could say. He runs a uh, a business called uh, Green Road Consulting. Uh, He is a director and on the investment committee for Aware Super. Um, He has also got a a fund called Beacon Capital, which looks at, uh, really looks at the impact investing and and businesses that are making an impact on the world. Uh, and not only that, um, he's doing a PhD in one of my favourite subjects of all time, the psychology and behavioural finance and decision-making of human beings. Welcome, Philip. Thanks very much, Fraser. I, you know, one of the biggest uh, issues I had to face was to decide whether to join this or not, and it was a quick and easy decision to be involved. <laughs> it certainly was. Well, we sort of looked at you and go, well, h- hang on a minute. Is there anybody that knows uh, this topic better than you? So fantastic. Thank you for uh, spending some time with us today. Now, the, this topic, uh, this first topic we're kicking off is around the concept of the marketing and promotion and the, and the noise that we're hearing in the marketplace. I love using the phrase so hot right now when it comes to uh, ESG. Um, <laughs> what are you hearing and seeing in the space? It was Hansel was so hot right now, right? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. Institutional investors in particular, but um, organized group of investors globally are focused on what, you know, they loosely call ESG. Uh, And they're focused on it for a couple of reasons. Number one is because um, globally the understanding is growing that uh, assets, not just companies, but assets produce more than just financial returns. Um, They interact with communities. They produce kind of what, what an economist would call externalities. You know, so they they might pollute or they might create jobs or they might uh, educate kids or, you know, there can be good and bad stuff that they do. And so loosely they can be grouped into environmental impacts and social impacts, so that's ENS. And how do we think about companies or assets managing those impacts beyond the financial returns? Well, that's G, that's governance. So loosely those three letters get bandied about to try and help investors think about something that's above and beyond just a straight financial return from an asset. Yep. We're seeing a lot of marketing in this space. Uh, obviously, a lot of uh, companies have got statements, a lot of um, you know funds that are coming out are making statements. Um, how do we make sense of all the statements uh, how do we how do we find the the message within the noise yeah so i'd, I'd go back one step and say why does esg matter apart from feeling good um and talking broadly and loosely about social license and all that kind of stuff esg matters because um markets increasing or investors increasingly understand that unless businesses and assets are sustainable their values will be reduced And so you want to be investing in assets that not only generate good returns, but they generate sustainable returns. And what's going to sustain a business or an asset, it's not just its financial returns, it's also the role it plays in our community. And so the obvious example is carbon pollution. So increasingly, carbon output can be measured, and in some jurisdictions it's taxed, in others it's not. But if you look at an Australian asset that has a big carbon footprint, it actually trades at a lower valuation than a similar asset with a, with a lower carbon 
footprint. So as an investor, whether there's a carbon tax or not, you want to know about the carbon put- footprint of the, of the asset because it's going to inf- uh, affect the return you make. And so for investors who are driven by total long-term returns for their, for their clients or themselves, ESG is really, sh- in my mind, it's shorthand for sustainability. It's just a way of thinking about sustainability. Sustainability is broader. ESG is narrower and easier to measure and, and, and address, but it's really all part of the same thing. Yep. And how do we how do we dive through some of the messaging? I, I mean, I, I think it, sort of this episode, I really want to try and knuckle in on that whole what's being fed uh, to the marketplace yeah. and how do we how do we make sense of it? Well, look, if anything's popular, frankly, people will try and find shortcuts to get benefit out of it. I don't want to you know necessarily imply that it's exploited, but you know we're in lockdown and there's COVID going on right now, and I'm getting text messages every few minutes from people who are telling me they've got a COVID test result and they're just trying to get into my phone and rip off my personal data. You know, so so that motivation to try and get as much as possible for as little effort out of movements or brands is endemic to the way we live our lives. So that's that's the the kind of psychology and behavioural finance part of it. Speaking in terms of ESG. Companies, in particular listed companies, you know, who are being evaluated uh, and have to report according to certain standards and so on, they're addressing the issues by firstly producing some measurements that are ostensibly there to try and help investors gauge what their impacts might be in those areas. And secondly, they're going to make a lot of statements about what they're going to do in the future. Now, what you're going to do in the future is no different to what you get from a politician speaking or a coach talking about next season or whatever it happens to be. It's not really much use to you unless you can see some evidence of it taking place. So I discount all of that. So what you're saying is past past performance matters in this particular – is more of an indicator of future performance? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so um, you want to see that plans are being put in place and so on. I think w- what we get from ESG from from uh, people who are embracing it properly, both on the investor side and the and the investee side – is they start to, to focus in on a couple of things that you can measure. So I think about carbon footprint, for instance. That's that's there's there's essentially broadly agreed kind of metrics that can be applied, and so that you can start to make some comparisons. E is probably easier to manage than uh, measure than than S, the social impact. But you can still talk about the number of jobs or the healthcare or whatever it happens to be. You can put some metrics around it. And G, well, G is more an internal uh, structure. What what I think you're getting at is should we be trusting some of the product that's been created around these thematics and should we be trusting and investing on the basis of the promises made by the asset uh, the, the companies and the assets that we're investing in and i you know i i would encourage skepticism around all of that but also um the fact that it's starting to be discussed and there's some metrics emerging is 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 a positive um you know this whole triple bottom line quadruple bottom line process isn't going away so we're on the pathway. The 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 bigger biggest problem for you know greenwashing or SG washing and whatnot is that there's no real agreed set of metrics. So you can come up with your own metrics and and publish them and they'll look good. But when you drill into them, maybe you know statistics and statistics. What is it really telling you? Yeah. Okay. So the 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 idea is to really look hard at the messaging and say, is it a yeah. is it a gunner? Is it is it something that sort of or, or, or very vague or is it something more specific and tangible? Yes, exactly. And the more tangible it is and, you know, the more that it can be evidenced by actual data that reports what has happened rather than what we're planning to do, the more credit the market will give and the more the companies move that way, the more credit for future plans will emerge. And the real the real coalescence of all of that will be when it becomes more and more clear to investors that you can actually make financial returns out of all of these things. So there's still this residual view, I think, in in – uh, investors' minds that ESG, sustainability, impact, whatever terms you want to use around of it, might come at a cost of financial return. I think the revolution has begun and will 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 emerge that what we see is that you don't make reduced financial returns, you actually enhance financial returns by embracing all these issues moving forward. Yeah, fantastic. And, and I want to get into that in the next episode as well. Um, but just on the idea of uh, that idea um, where consumers are right now. What's the messaging that advisors should be using um, in this space then if they want to lean into uh, ESG investing as something that one of their philosophies um, to promote to the market or to their clients? Well, I think the first thing I would conversation I, I personally would have would be that the whole idea about ESG is that it's just 
a somewhat simpler uh, group of measures to a- attack this whole issue of sustainability. The sustainability of businesses and assets um, will drive returns from those assets, and so that's something you want. So here's an area we should be focusing in on, number one. Yep. Number two, um, you really want to be looking for organisations that are trying to measure uh, in some form these components and that they clearly explain how they're measuring them, um, what what the framework they're using is to try and avoid the any washing that's going on or any kind of taking advantage of the thematic. And the third is to uh, is to insist really that those that you are working with who are not talking about ESG in their portfolios or measuring it, that you think that at some point in the future this will be essential for your clients to remain involved with them so that, you know, it's, it's not it's not going to be a, an optional. It's it's just going to be an essential. And to be yeah. honest, if you go to the big world of – big world, that sounds really arrogant. I don't mean that, but, you know, big pools of capital, so the big supers globally, not just in Australia, particularly in Europe – it's not. A, it's not a. Oh, and they do ESG as well. If there's no ESG measurement or understanding for the assets, they just don't even qualify to be looked at. Oh, very good. And so you mentioned sort of um, greenwashing, which is obviously um, a, a bit of a theme that's has a lot of conversation around that at the moment. Um, so this is greenwashing from uh, fund managers down or companies out uh, outwards. Is it also something that advisors need to be careful of with their own messaging? Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know. It, 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 one person's greenwashing is not is is not another person's green. So you, 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 I, sometimes I talk to people about you know there being high church and low church in this this space. There are some people who are have set themselves incredibly high standards that are actually quite difficult to meet, um, and that limits the pool of assets or, or, or businesses that you can invest in because they've got to meet these very very high standards, and that's great. But the vast majority of the assets and businesses aren't going to going to achieve those high standards on day one. And so moving them towards a better outcome, personally, I think that's a great objective for investors to have. So working with people who don't really understand their ESG but are improving it and embracing it is a really valuable thing to do. So you've got to make a decision as an individual whether you want to work with a broad group who are getting better or you're only going to work with the ones who are good already. Um, my preference is, is to try and move the bulk but I understand that there'll be some people who are, you know, who who just want to be involved with the with the very highest uh, church. Yeah, I can I can I can get that too, and I can understand that that means an advisor's role is to find out um, where that client what sits. What the client wants. Exactly. Yeah, what they what they want in that space, and and whether they want to help influence, uh, or the whether they just want to sit in the space that's already been there, done that. Yeah, well, so let me give you a really obvious example. We need mining. You know, you're going to mine stuff, even if it's to make batteries for cars, you're going to mine stuff. And so you don't need oil or coal maybe, but you do know. So I'm not going to invest in any mining. Well, then you're not going to get electric cars. So are you going to invest in a miner who's improving their environmental footprint and at the same time bringing us technology that's going to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and so on? That's the kind of conversation you need to have. Fair enough. Okay, very good. Deeper, deeper, deeper conversations. I love it. Philip, thanks for catching up on this episode. Uh, we look forward to uh, hearing you from you in the next episode when we get into the, is there an actual need for ESG, which I think you'll have a lot to say on. So look forward to chatting to you then. Thanks, Fraser. Welcome to this episode, Elizabeth Hatton. Good morning and good morning to, or good evening to everyone who's listening. Uh, my name is Elizabeth and I run a small financial advice practice called Viva Financial Advice. Fantastic. And, and you've been running that practice for a few years now and you sort of have a bit of a uh, uh, conversa- a lot of conversation with your clients around uh, ESG. I do have quite a lot of clients in conversations with clients about ESG and people are quite fired up about ESG and what it means and they're fired up about being ethical and ESG and ethical and sustainable investing isn't just ethical and sustainable investing, but some people come to see me because they say, oh, you're ethical, and I'm looking, talk to them about what their ESG preferences are, and they say, that's not why we came to see you. And so there's a lot of, I think the issue is that there's a lot of uh, mixed messages about what ESG actually means, what ethical actually means, what people's interpretation of it is and therefore what their demand is when they come to see you. But from my point of view, um, people come to talk to me because they have a problem. 
um, and that can be any, any one of a number of problems that I can or can't um, manage or help them with. Yep. And ESG and looking at the ethical and sustainable investing is one way of helping them move through what the financial solutions to some of their problems might be. Yep, fantastic. And in this episode, of course, we're focusing on the messaging and the marketing and the and all of the promotion that goes around uh, ESG. There's there's two sides to the story. Really, there's the the marketing and promotion information that's fed to financial advisors themselves from the fund managers, and then there's the messaging that comes out to consumers. Tell me about uh, tell me about the consumers coming to see you. Um, we'll start with consumers. When consumers come and see you, what are they hearing, or what, what are their preferences around ESG? How are they being communicated to? They're hearing that um, ESG and ethical investing is something that uh, they can do and that they're already doing. And when we actually go into and, and it's something they're wanting to do. Um, and so there are people who are wanting to do this in with various amounts of conviction and passion. Uh, and I think that often when we start to dig into the details of what they're actually investing in, they're surprised that their super or other investments aren't as ethical as they might wish them to be. Or yeah, they this, would be hoping. Yep. This is a really interesting point, isn't it? It's, uh, the the un, uncovering this, and we're going to certainly uncover this with certain some of the other uh, episodes of conversations we're going with. Um, but do you do you feel like that some of the information that they're getting in this space, then in that case, is is not quite on the money or on the mark? It is certainly not quite on the money on on the mark from a purist point of view. Um, but it may well be on the money or on the mark in terms of the various options that, um, for example, a super fund may offer. They may offer something that is more um, ethical or, or has, has got better ESG flavour than other sort of holdings or asset classes that are on offer, but it may not actually be um, as green as what it is that the client is wishing. Yep. And uh, is this also the, the case for the the information that's coming out of, well, the fund managers or the information that's being fed to financial advisors around uh, what is and what isn't? Um, and is there a is there a perception um, versus reality conversation to be had here? Um, I think I think that there can be, and I think that quite a lot of the time there is. Um, and people who or fund managers who adamantly say, well, yes, we do do things that are particularly green, often aren't. Um, and they don't necessarily want to have that conversation with you about what yep. it is that they're actually doing and their asset classes there um, and the way that they're um, engaging with uh, companies that they invest in to try and make sure that their governance practices are principled, shall we say. Yeah, so how do you, how do you dig deeper into that? How do you find out what, what's uh, the underlying um, ESG components are if, if, if everybody's sort of saying that they are? Um, I um, belong to a couple of groups that are particularly interested in this. One of them is the Responsible Investment Association of Australia and the other one is the Ethical Advisors Cooperative. And I actually do quite like digging deep. I actually like to go into a fund and see what their major holdings are. I like to see if they're transparent in terms of their... Um, holdings and the way that they're reporting. Um, I like to see what their voting record is on sort of particular ethical and sustainable issues. Um, and I also like to see what their governance practices are like and if they're actually moving along the lines of what their policies and philosophies say they are. So this yep. really falls back on you as the as the planner and a, and a couple of groups that you you know are part of to to go and find these things. Um, there's well, there's quite a lot of research literature available out there, and I think that the issue is that the re research effort and doing this sort of fairly digging uh, digging fairly deep is limited because it's pretty intensive. But there are a few databases out there that you can look at. And I find that the products that are out there that are reasonably deep green are limited. And of course, some of this is also, um, is also uh, driven by what it is that the clients want and what they have in their own particular mind. 
And then that goes down to the issue of sort of um, what level of risk can they tolerate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because there's what it is that people are wanting to invest in from a values point of view and also what they need to be doing in terms of their life generally to make sure that they can um, live in a reasonable way. And those things often need to be um, negotiated or rejigged. Yep. So the messaging coming out of the that that you're receiving as an advisor, do you often find that's that's correct, or are you finding that um that, that you know when you dig deeper, it's not quite the, the case? Sometimes it's correct. Okay, about sixty or seventy percent of the time it's correct, and thirty percent of the time it's not. Is there is there a little bit of um, marketing that goes along with that that sort of says, oh, we don't do this or we don't do that, but then. But then, you know, again, that that could be something that nobody does that or nobody does this or that's just not even a thing Um, that exists. I think think that sort of that people say we don't do this and we don't do that, but then nobody does that anyway. So that's part of the marketing thing anyhow. But I think that the issue is that people, that fund managers um, and funds want investment. And so this is a, a marketing a marketing exercise to actually get uh, clients' money invested in their particular option. And I think that it, because it's the flavour of the month or, you know, probably the flavour of the year, then there's a, a big impetus to try and um, make your product as attractive as possible. Yeah. So what tips do you give to advisors in that space where they're, they're wanting to go deeper into the into the green Let's say, uh, um, what what tips would you give to them about um, the marketing messages they're hearing from hearing in the market at the moment? Um, I would suggest that you don't take anything on face value, yep. um, and that you actually um, have a look at uh, some of the um, background information. I mean, I think that the, the the two good places to start with all of this are the RAA and Ethical Advisors, yeah, Advisors Cooperative. They've got all of their stuff um, up there on the web. There's leaf ratings that is um, voted on by a number of ethical advisors as well that actually rates funds in terms of how green they are um, on an ethics-only perspective. Um, And so what you should do is look for funds based on their um, um, ethical credentials and then look at the fundamentals in terms of finances down the track. As yep. a screening method, yep. Fantastic. Thank you, Elizabeth. We'll, uh, we'll catch you in the next, next episode where we start talking about uh, is there an actual need for ethical investing in ESG? Really appreciate your time. Welcome to this episode, Paul Garner. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. Now, tell us a little bit about yourself. I've noticed you've been an advisor for 15-odd years and you're, uh, you're working in South Australia. So I career changed into financial planning in 2007 and uh, I... Uh, oh well, a boutique practice gave me uh, an opportunity. They said we it was at, it was at the height of the market in 2007, and uh, they said they couldn't find anyone suitable. So, if I was prepared to start at the bottom, uh, they'd give me a go. So that's what I did, and worked with them for three years, and saw the absolute top, and then the absolute decline of the GFC, the slow train wreck that it was. And um, worked with them for three years and then worked uh, and that finished (laughs) and uh, then worked for Westpac for three years and uh, always had the ambition to uh, begin my own practice and uh, slowly uh, developed that thought into uh, also wanting to specialise in ethical and responsible investment when I eventually went on my own. Yep. And uh, so I saw... uh, the best of financial planning in the boutique practice and then the bank was fantastic for a little while and then just went um, yeah, uh, well, the whole the other way, which is, you know, the whole... Um, I kind of feel <laughs> like you did two, two short apprenticeships in that uh, in that space, you know, like the, the, the idea of working for a small boutique and then a, and a large bank and getting a whole lot of different perspectives and then being able to set up the business that you wanted um uh, within the ethical investment space, now you're also uh, you're also a, an advisory board member of the uh, the ethical advisors co-op, which I'll ask you about throughout the series. Uh, and oh. you're on the uh, the FPA's uh, policies and standards board as well. Yes, uh, one of their board committees, um, and so 
uh, you know, as a as a relatively uh, or, or as an older person, but a relatively young uh, financial advisor, I just thought I'll get stuck into everything I can to try to learn and yep. and yep. Uh, be be part of it and try to uh, influence the policy and and uh, the way things work or or get an insight into how things work. Yep, brilliant, absolutely. Now, uh, this in this particular episode, we're talking uh, uh, all sorts of things around ESG, but we're talking about messaging, marketing, and promotion. Uh, and this probably, uh, you mentioned a career change. You were a marketing manager prior to that. Yes. Well, I've done a number of things, but that was my last iteration, career iteration prior to that, marketing management in um, IT companies mainly, and then had a stint, a couple of stints in government. Yeah, fantastic. Now, you, so, so you'll know exactly what we're talking about when it comes to messaging and marketing. We're sort of covering off a lot in this episode around the concept of greenwashing, um, you know, perception versus reality. The, the messaging that's out there, um, I, I keep saying this in this episode, but so hot right now, you know, it's a hot topic, um, ESG. Talk to, talk to us about what you're seeing um, around in the space and, and, you know, how do you make sense of it? Yeah, look, I, I started on my own practice uh, late 2013, 2014, and uh, that whole concept was not well known. Um, the, you know, the myths about you have to sacrifice returns uh, for for the ethical values uh, was very prevalent. Um, and there were just a few themed managed funds or filtered managed funds. Uh, otherwise, it was... Uh, a compromise in in trying to match someone's values to to their uh, investment, um, and and the the change over the last oh since then has been amazing in terms of the amount of funds available, the, the themed funds. So, uh, like uh, and so, human nature is that uh, when there's a hot topic, uh, there will inevitably be people to oh this looks good, let's ride along that. And so that's been part of, uh, I guess, the the due diligence, the the vetting of uh, looking at options to help match. It's, it's always a match with people's values. So, um, there, what well, whatever's out there, it's that it's that match between what's there and what people value, or what they want to avoid, what they want to support, and then finding that right mix. So. There has been um, much, uh, you know, a dramatic increase in ethical themed funds. So part of the work that we do as, a, as, a, as an advisor specialising in that area and also with the Ethical Advisors Cooperative is we vet uh, fund managers who build, their, build a financial product with that filter and we assess them as to what's good about them, what's not, and then that gives us and the community in general uh, an idea of, well, here's a fund with ethical or ESG or sustainable or whatever in the title, but what does that actually mean? What's underneath that? And there's uh, different funds have different compromises that they will make to fulfil their investment guidelines as well as the ethical filters so they'll make that decision based on what they think it should be and then it's up to us as advisors to decide whether okay if that's appropriate for the person we're talking to and uh, if there's compromises there if they're comfortable with those compromises then that type of fund might be suitable i I guess the best uh, greenwashing i've seen is where an australian share fund Oh, I had ethical or whatever in the in the in the label, and they said that their main um, exclusions was uh, tobacco and armaments, and yeah. um, <laughs> neither <laughs> neither of those, those of those things are manufactured in Australia. So it's like, okay, well, what's the difference between that and and uh, and just yep. a regular Australian share fund? Uh, but that didn't last long. <laughs> yeah, that's a really interesting one, isn't it? No, no, we exclude tobacco and arms uh, from our Australian share fund. Excellent. So does everybody yeah. else because yes. there is none. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's interesting that the, the marketing spin. And that's what that's what I'm, I mean. Uh, you know, like your marketing background history, you try and find a thing to uh, the, the thing about the, the product to promote. 
Um, so, but you mentioned the idea of the um, the work that you're doing with the the you know the ethical advisors co-op in going in and then looking at those messages um, and then bringing them to light. How can people sort of find out about that or or, or see more about what you're doing at the ethical advisors co-op? Yeah, so uh, that that's a group of advisors who share the same um, ideals, same passion about um, the industry, and we work together to encourage the industry to develop appropriate products, uh, to vet existing products and to work with financial uh, fund managers to develop or enhance their existing products to be more suitable. So uh, Ethical Advisors Cooperative is, uh, uh, we have a website and we have recently or within the last two years developed a funds, uh, a leaf rating system where we as a group will uh, investigate and vet fund managers and then we vote on it and give it a leaf rating. So five leaves, five leaves is the uh, ideal. And so we base it on what an average, so it's very subjective, but uh, it, it, what an average ethical advisor would think of the investments within this fund. Yep. And, uh, so we rate that, uh, we, we give that feedback to the fund manager and then uh, they either take that on board or, or they, they state their case and uh, we try to rate it not on a uh, investment performance criteria, that's plenty of other people do that, but just on how we assess its um, ethical filter. Yeah, now this is interesting because uh, we'll probably get into this a bit deeper in some of the other uh, episodes. But um, and you, as you mentioned, it's subjective. There's no, there's no guide. There's no exact science to this. Um, talk to me about: uh, is five leaves deep green, or is uh, is that what you're looking? You're looking for deep green as five leaves, and 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 one Correct. leaf is light, very light green. Yep. Yep. We'll probably cover off on that in the third episode when we talk sort of the fifty shades of green. But uh, yes. I think, you know that's that's a fantastic um, you know system. And, and what's the website for the Ethical Advisors Co-op? Uh, yeah, Ethical Advisors Co-op or Leaf Ratings. We'll, we'll search on those terms, and you will get straight there. I'll let you know Excellent. the um, okay. exact address. We'll include it in the show notes. Um, speaking of marketing messages, what should advisors be um, doing with their marketing messages when it comes to what they're um, what they're you know saying to their clients or what they're saying to their the, the people that might become clients of this? Well, look, I I, I specialise in this area, so uh, all, all of my marketing messages are, are around this area. So I'm looking to attract people who have that interest and uh, and want to reflect their values through through how they're investing. So for me, it's a specialty, and I think if you're going down that area, you've got to um, focus on that those issues. If 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 you're not special, obviously specialising in that area, and people are asking about it, then I I, I think that's probably more prevalent these days than that the greater awareness of it through the media, uh, through social interactions is is making it more high profile. But I think if you're wise about it, you, you're going to have to specialise in that area and, and, and make that messaging uh, to yeah. do with that uh, and, and, uh, and to uh, expand on that issue for yourself. I don't think you can dabble in it. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I sort of feel it's a um, it becomes a, a you know your investment philosophy and something that you then promote as a bias almost in the way that you select funds because we we you know we, I personally have this bias for the, the the outcomes of you know ethical invest ethical businesses on society, which we'll sort of get to in another in another episode um, or the next episode. But uh, if if that's the case, then you will attract and you and you outwardly say this is my my personal investment philosophy. That's my personal bias when it comes to my financial planning, you know, recommendations. So you will then attract people who also agree with that. Yeah, uh, but but I, I I don't make any judgment. It's it's purely about whatever the values that the individual has it's about matching that with what's available yep. Yep. um so 
and 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 that's as different as and that's the subjectivity of it because it's so different from person to person is what's yep. important to them what do they want to avoid what do they want to support what Excellent. don't they care which, about which we're covering in another episode so what we'll do uh, Paul we'll leave it there for this episode and uh, we'll look forward to catching you in the next one thank you welcome to this episode Alexandra Brown thank you so much for having me today Fraser Fantastic. Now you you're an amazing person in the space. You run a uh, you're the founder of a, of a business called Invest with Ethics, where you actually work with financial advisors, helping them shape their businesses around uh, you know providing ethical investment advice to their clients. I do. It's a I absolutely love what I do. I get to work with some of the best advisors who are really passionate about helping their clients in the ethical investment space. It's a wonderful place to be. Yeah, fantastic. And of course, you, you do that through all sorts of one-on-one and accelerators. And, uh, and, and we'll probably dive into a bit more of the stuff as we go of all the stuff you do around in this space uh, with, the, with the ethical advisors co-op, uh, of which you're, uh, you do a lot of support and you're on the board with. Um, and also, uh, the, uh, as a research manager of, a, of, of, a, of an entity that I can't pronounce, let's, let's go with that. Tell us about that. Sure. So I am the head of research at Aotearum. It's a sustainable online finance library. And we basically or effectively take all of the great research that's out there on ESG and ethical investing. We summarize it, pull out the key insights and and transform it into a really digestible format for, for users and for advocates who want to create change in the industry. Yeah. And you pretty much spend your entire life around this one subject, right? Including all of your I, I study. <laughs> I do. I was about 10 years in academia prior to that, you know, doing lots of research on ESG leader and laggard portfolios and, and uh, all sorts. I, I live and breathe it. Absolutely. So have you done your PhD? Is that how? I did my PhD research. So I did three or four years of a, of, of a PhD. And unfortunately, there was a, a researcher in Queensland who published a report that was too similar to my own research. So it was no longer a unique contribution, and uh, we tried to pivot and we tried to to reinvent it, but it was it was too late by that stage. It wasn't going to be unique. My goodness! So so three years into a four year study, and uh, otherwise, you could, well, I could be speaking to Dr. Alexandra Brown right now. You could, you could, and no doubt you will in the future. I actually purchased the dralexandrabrown.com URL, <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> it is on the cards. It's going to happen one day. That's a good way of, uh, you know, uh, putting it in your brain so it's going to happen. Excellent. Mm. So, all right, well, I won't call you doctor, but we, we, we kind of know that you're pretty much pretty at that level, of, I guess you could say. Uh, t- let's, uh, let's kick off this. Uh, in this episode, we've done a lot of um, uh, talking around the concept of marketing and, and, and promotion and some of the noise we hear um, in, the, in the market at the moment. Tell us what, your, what are your thoughts on what you're hearing? Yeah, it really is. It's so hot right now. And I think it's because there are so many drivers happening at the moment with, you know, the global trends and consumer demand, climate change is at the, at the forefront, fossil fuel, divestment movement, net zero emissions targets, COVID, you know, COVID's really brought around those social issue, uh, issues in prominence. There's, guidance from financial regulators. And and of course, this all means that fund managers are really getting on board and they're fighting to get in front of advisors. So it's, it's, it's in the media, but you know, uh, you mentioned the co-op and, um, you know, you say that it's so hot right now, but the co-op is actually celebrating their 10 year anniversary this year. So, you know, for a a lot, a long time, this has been at the forefront for a number of advisors who you know, recognize the need to um, represent and, and I guess advocate on behalf of, of ethical and sustainable uh, uh, investments and clients that wanted this as well. So, yeah, it's hot right now with fund managers and advisors but, and the media is catching up, but it, it has been there for a while. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Ten, it, anybody can get, be an overnight success in ten years, can't they? It's sort of one of those one of those <laughs> scenarios. If you if you stick to your guns and you and you work at it, I think that's. Um, I think you know. I, I hear that a lot with stuff. You know, things that are are booming uh, don't just boom out of nowhere. There is you know years of um, years of history that go behind it. So, yeah, it's, it, that's a, that's a good point to make. Um, and and you're right. There are a lot of marketing departments jumping on. The bandwagon and and and, and messaging. What, what what sort of messaging are you seeing at the moment that could be considered to be you know a little bit of greenwashing? 
Oh gosh, there is, there's definitely a lot of greenwashing and, you know, simply put, it just means, you know, that a company or fund, they're using, they're using words, they're using PR, they're using imagery that, that seems, makes them seem a little bit more ethical or environmentally conscious than, than what they are. Uh, you know, I think some of the examples would be fund managers stating that they screen out certain things like fossil fuels, but they only screen out certain types of fossil fuels. So they might only be screening out coal, but but gas is still, you know, in the portfolio uh, or their, their screening thresholds are really high. So, you know, fossil fuel companies are still remaining in the portfolio. I think for mixed asset portfolios as well, you know, the screening process is only perhaps used on the equities portion, but not on the fixed income portion. Uh, other greenwashing examples that I'm seeing is you know, saying that they're ethical, but then they're not voting against all the resolutions that are asking for increased climate change disclosure, or they're voting against changes that are put forward that would support human rights and workers' rights and Indigenous rights. And and I guess one more would be using just using vague language with no conviction behind it. Uh, I, I recently read a responsible investment policy and, and without a word of a lie, it said it seeks to limit most carbon intensive fossil fuels. <laughs> and I was just like, what does that even mean? You know, so I would like to say, though, that there is a lot of greenwashing, but, you know, it's not always deliberate. There are funds that are moving into this space, too. And, you know, through my work with the, with the co-op, I've seen so many improvements. And sometimes the co-op will go to a fund and they'll bring, you know, to attention something that could be improved, like better disclosure and, or what have you. And, and the fund will improve that or vice versa. A fund will come to the co-op and say, like, what, what do they need to do? What, it, what are clients looking for? What is best practice in this area? So I think that, you know, there are a lot of funds that are trying to do the right thing. So, so it's not always deliberate greenwashing. And I think it provides a really great opportunity there for dialogue between advisors and fund managers to actually improve together as well. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, the seeks to limit most. I love that. Uh, that. That pretty much means you can do nothing and you could still say you see, you were seeking to limit most. Um, yeah. But you're right. You're, you're absolutely right in that space there. You know, that's turning a ship, right? They're, you know, a lot of fund managers don't have the ability to, to turn on a dime uh, and to be able to do the right thing. It sort of takes a bit of a bit of turning. Um, and maybe it's uh, maybe it's being led by the marketing. But I guess what we're doing now is we're holding the marketing accountability accountable aren't we for okay you said last year you're going to do these things and and you haven't done it yet therefore there is a there is the problem yeah absolutely accountability is a great point yeah so there's a fair bit of noise out there um talk to me a little bit about what uh, how you work with uh planners and what you say to them with regards to the messaging that they could be putting out around um around uh, esg uh i guess you know if an advisor is providing ethical and responsible investment advice, firstly, they're going to stand out without a doubt and, and they can use that to their advantage. Absolutely. It's a great positioning for themselves. Currently, if you go to the RIA website, which is the Responsible Investing Association of Australasia, there are 29 certified financial advisors with RIA and seven of them are in New Zealand. So it's only 22. RIA certified advisors here in Australia. And in the ethical advisors co-op, there's about 36 advisor members. And, you know, granted that there are some advisors out there who specialize in, in this space and they're not certified by RIA and they're not in the co-op. But to put this into perspective, there's, I think, about 19,000 advisors in Australia, you know. So if you're in this space, you are positioning yourself as, as a, you know, as a leader in this space. And there is so much demand for ethical investment advice. And so, you know, just these numbers alone show good reason to get into the space and stand out. But I think as far as positioning themselves goes, Similar to the expectations of fund managers, advisors should be transparent about what they can actually provide in this space. So no greenwashing for advisors as well. Um, they can use their websites, use their communications, uh, social media, client newsletters to really highlight 
the ESG issues that, that are covered in their advice, uh, that they specialise in, that matter most to their clients. Advisors running events, webinars on ESG topics and to really demonstrate expertise. And I think it's just the best opportunity to really just highlight the extra value that you offer in your services. You know, are you building portfolios that are aligning with the client values? Can you assist your clients with proxy voting and advocacy campaigns? And there are so many benefits to, to providing ethical advice. Yeah, I really do. I really do feel it's a, it's a conversation once you get into it. Um, that if, if this is your passion and your belief, then you know that that does resonate out into the marketplace. I, I was talking to an advisor the other day who had been on a, a few different podcasts and uh, and said that um, that clients were listening to those podcasts uh, first and then and then coming along and saying, you know, you I, you believe in what I believe and I want to, I want to be your client. You know, obviously. And, and I, I can consider anything like that, any investment philosophy that somebody has is a, a philosophy. It's a, it's a, it's a, essentially it's a bias, but it's a good bias because it's, it's, it's upfront and it's, and it's um, transparent and then people can then resonate towards that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it is, you're right, it is uh, working with purpose you know, aligning your role as advisor with, with uh, your own values too, which is, which is so great. It's meeting the client demand, meeting those expectations. It's increasing your connection with clients, you know, in so many ways, building those deeper, longer lasting relationships, growing trust, growing loyalty. Um, but overall, I mean, being an ethical advisor, it is a marketable strategy. So it's, it's seen as cutting edge. It's simply just by being across these things, it's a selling point for you as an advisor. So it's, it's not only an effective client retention strategy, but it would also help you stand out to potential clients. Yep. Now in your research and any of your research, have you done any um, ideas around what percentage of the client market are interested in, in ESG? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I say that is because you, you gave us the stats on, you know, the amount of uh, people who specialize in this space uh, versus the number of financial advisors, uh, which yes. is obviously a huge, a huge one. So we might uh, see if we can get that information out of you in a future episode. Um, but in the next episode, I also want to uh, jump onto that uh, and have a bit more conversation around that alignment and purpose. Because I think, um, you know, when we talk about if there's actually a need for ESG, you know, there's also a, a fantastic opportunity for advisors to align their business with their own values. So, uh, Alexandra, thank you so much for coming on this first episode. We look forward to hearing from you in the rest of the series. Thanks a lot, Fraser. Welcome, James, to this episode on uh, We're Talking All Things ESG. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Fraser. Good to be with you. Fantastic. Now, James Harwood, you are a senior portfolio manager with Russell. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, Fraser, I'm um, running Australian equity and global equity funds for, for Russell. I uh, have a sp specialization in ESG strategies, so uh, running both our um, ESG ETF, RARI, uh, and also, also some of our low-carbon funds in both Australian and global, global shares. Fantastic. So you're the expert in this, uh, in this field. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, no, no. Look, it's been a been a great area to be involved in over the last few years, and uh, yeah, I think the great thing about ESG investing is it's always evolving. So it's probably the most exciting area of of investment at, at the moment. Yes, it certainly is. It certainly is evolving. It certainly is one of the hot topics around at the moment as well. Uh, we're, we're sort of talking a lot of things today um, in this episode around the the marketing and the messaging and the promotion that's going along. There is a lot going on, isn't there? Look, there is. There's. Uh, I think probably the the best reflection is just the the flows of money into these ESG strategies. Um, we're seeing that, you know, particularly in Europe, um, definitely in Australia as well, and uh, I think the US is starting to finally catch up as well. So it's not been a big theme um, in the US. I think you know with President Trump, it was clearly ESG was not a focus of his, but um, I think even investors over there now are, um, you know. Are, really following this kind of ESG trend as well. Yeah, well, it's good to see Australia as one of the, the world leaders in this phase, I guess. Yes, no, for sure. The, I think the, the superannuation money that we have, um, you know, the, the super funds have big ESG teams. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking later about, you know, some of the 
uh, the investor groups and how they they influence companies um you know on their governance and corporate practices and uh you know definitely uh you know the wealth of money that we have in superannuation and uh you know the teams behind that is is really helping uh you know drive drive the ESG trend in in our market yep Exactly. Now, there's a, now speaking of the, the promotional side and the marketing side, there is a lot of information out there. Um, it's it's a topic that sort of um, came out came along pretty quickly, as in um, the the marketing promotion really ramped up around this uh, sort of not so long ago. Uh, what are we seeing out there with regards to some of the the noise in the marketplace uh, versus the you know I guess I'm trying to look at what sort of perception versus reality. Yeah, look, I think it's a good question, and, and I'm sure one that's on um, the lips of a lot of advisors as well. Um, you know, I think most most investment firms are now um, saying that they you know they invest with ESG considerations in mind or integrate ESG into the investment process. Um, I think the question is, what does that that really mean? And um, you know, in terms of products, you know, how to to really um, avoid greenwashing. Um, that's that's a, a term that's that's become quite commonplace and you know greenwashing is really uh, the overstating of a, a product's ESG credentials uh, i think what's what's really important for you know for advisors is you know clear product labeling of, of a particular product you know how how green is that product uh, it's certainly something that we spend a lot of time um, thinking about at russell in terms of you know the the information we 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 provide on our ESG products in terms of um, fact sheets etc you know what you know what what characteristics are they providing ESG minded investors so i think that that product labeling aspect of uh particular investment products is really important to to avoid greenwashing basically yeah and is there a bit of a benchmark around with that or like how do advisors how do they tell the difference um not really is the honest answer i think the there's a number of different metrics that um that that we we measure our funds against so um, you know, for sure, carbon carbon emissions and carbon footprint, that's a fairly standard um, uh, way of looking at you know, how green a product might be or, you know, how exposed to, to carbon it, it is. Um, you know, as, as um, this trend away from fossil fuels has, um, has, has gathered, gathered steam, um, you know, that's, that's something that, that investors are really um, wanting to know now. You know, what is the carbon footprint of their uh, portfolio or the fund that they're investing in relative to a benchmark like the ASX 200. So that's something that, that you know, that, that's certainly the kind of um, things that, that, that we're doing now as, as, as standard, really. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I guess it's it's trying to bring some factual information to, to, to from what I've been t- speaking about and hearing, it's about being that factual information. And you sort of mentioned the words like, you know, um, with considerations and in mind, uh, they're all nice and they're nice fluffy words, but they don't actually mean anything, do they? They're sort of, it's the, we're looking for the, the tangible stuff. Yeah, uh, that, that's right. And I think, um, you know, the, uh, probably the, the most um, common thing now is that, that all investment firms say that they, they consider ESG in, in what they're doing. Um, what does that really mean and what's the end product? And, uh, um, you know, I think governance or the G of, of ESG is, has been, you know, a key part of um, stock pickers for you know, forever, really. You know, they, they've always been focused on the governance of, a, of companies. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, the environmental side, the social side is uh, uh, becoming more and more important to, to investors. And, um, you know, we, we, we do have, you know, aggregate, ESG scores um, that that we can also um, rate our funds on. So you know the the RARI ETF, for example, we we always compare how how that scores on overall ESG characteristics um, versus its benchmark, the ASX 200. So you know clients can see there is a there is an improvement over the the standard kind of market market index. Yep. And so it's obviously this is something a world that advisors are looking at navigating. There's this, the commentary around yeah. it in the marketing and promotion. What sort of tips would you have for advisors, or how can advisors help to cut through the noise? Yeah, I think probably the first thing is to really understand what their clients are looking for. Um, one thing that that I speak um, a lot to to advisors and with our sales team, um, trying to understand you know you know where. A client sits on that ESG spectrum, or you know, what kind of shade of green is that that client looking for? So I think there's there's kind of one end of the spectrum is the you know the really dark green where you know uh, 
clients might want to have nil exposure to, to mining companies. Um, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, people want better ESG characteristics, but they don't want to to kind of take huge risks by not owning, you know, a lot of the the mining companies, etc. And you know, mining is cl- clearly a big part of um, our economy. It's really important to to to, to Australia, uh, and um, you know, all of our ESG funds. Whilst there's often some kind of fossil fuel related um, uh, screen that we use in those strategies, um, we're still we still have exposures to, to other companies, say like a Fortescue Metals. That's um, you know it's it's iron ore focus. It's not focused on uh, fossil fuels, and um, you know, I'm sure you're aware that you know that company is really making you know significant investments in renewable technology as well with with hydrogen, etc. So you know I think you know our um, our opinion is that you know certainly miners are not all bad. You know that's that's um, uh, the wrong perception, and we haven't designed those really dark green kind of products for that reason. You know that that um, you know I think uh, um, a lot of these companies will be solutions. You know in the energy transition as we kind of move to a net zero emissions, um, we we need some of these big companies to to change their business models and uh, and you know produce products. You know with with um, with the future in mind and, and lowering carbon emissions, etc. Yeah, it sounds like um, obviously you, 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 as a fund manager, you need to have philosophies around that um, and be able to then communicate that out to the market and to advisors. Yes, you do. Yeah, um, I think there's there's and that's a number of levels. The you know the governance side remains important. So you know the uh, I think we spoke earlier about you know how in, how, in, how ahead of the game you know a lot of um, Australian investors are. Um, so governance and uh, uh, how we engage with companies through you know proxy voting um we we need to make sure that that our shareholdings count uh, and you know what what you've seen over the the past few years is you know a lot of in, uh, industry bodies evolve to to really influence um you know how how companies behave and and how they are transitioning um for the future so probably a great example just recently you know BHP um they They've been looking to exit um, fossil fuels, um, and and have, have done a deal with with Woodside. Uh, that, that's still not not um, effective yet, but um, likely from next year, um, we're going to have BHP as really a you know more of a pure pure play kind of metals um, miner. Uh, and I think that, that that then makes it you know able and eligible for a lot of other strategies that it, that it might otherwise not have um, been allowed to to reside in. So. Uh, we, we saw that as well with with Woolworths just just recently with them spinning off Endeavour Group, their alcohol business. Um, yeah, I know uh, in our own ETF, Rory um, Woolworths was excluded because of that uh, uh, that al- alcohol exposure. We're about to sit down and review those exclusions again, and um, you know, look, Woolworths will be back permitted as a as, as an investment because it no longer has that al- alcohol exposure. So this is happening, you know. Everywhere, you know, not not just us, but um, uh, a lot of companies are looking for, you know, companies to have the the right exposures and and, and kind of avoid those sin or the, you know, the the areas that that do harm, like tobacco as well. So, um, yeah, I think that that's it's it's been a you know major theme, and it's really driving, you know, where superannuation funds and 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 other other firms invest their money. So, I think. Really yeah. understanding that is is, is 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 crucially important. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, James, for coming on uh, and, and joining us in this series. Uh, we're going to wrap up this episode, but it certainly does sound like uh, advisors, uh, there's a lot of uh, work to be done, a lot of reading to be done, and a lot of understanding to be able to cut through the, the marketing uh, and promotional side to get to get to what's actually lying underneath the messages. So thank you, James. We look forward to catching you in the next episode. Thanks, Fraser. Mm-hmm.